What have we got today? What are we looking at? Yeah, so we're looking at M80 today, which is a globular cluster. So it's a globular cluster in the constellation of Scorpius. It's really easy to find because it's so dense. It's about 100,000 stars in M80. It's one of the densest known globular clusters in the Milky Way. So it's a really exciting cluster because it's so dense. The other reason that I love it is that it's in an area of sky next to something that's absolutely beautiful. This is called the Rho Ophiuchi Nebula, which I probably pronounced terribly and butchered that, but this nebula is gorgeous. It's one of the nearest star-forming regions to the Milky Way. Where's our country? Customer. It's a tiny little blue fuzz dot right in the top left hand corner. So this thing's about 400 light years away and the globular cluster is about 300,000 light years away. There's nowhere actually near in space, but it's near on the sky. I just wanted to show this because it was a pretty picture. It's lovely. It's beautiful. Being so dense, it means there's a lot going on. You know, there's a lot of stars or jostling for space right in the center of the cluster. So that means that you've got a lot of collisions of stars, a lot of like close passes of stars. That tends to make a lot of blue stragglers, which I think Mike already discussed way back when, when he talked about M3. But the other thing, because it's so dense, there's just so much energy available. So it means that you can look in really high energy wavelengths. So I found this paper from 2003, Heinke et al. And they used the Chandra X-ray telescope to look at M80. So they're literally X-raying this globular cluster. This is the image that they got of M80. It's kind of boring, isn't it? But it is a picture of this globular cluster in X-rays. So can you see these two rings that they've put around their image? So this is sort of their outer circle. That's at like 39 arc seconds. You know, 60th of a degree is an arc minute, and a 60th of that is an arc second. And this inner one's at six arc seconds, whereas the whole cluster itself is nine arc minutes across. So this X-ray image is right in the very center, in that densest region that really is sort of overexposed, where you've just got sort of like flat light from the optical image. And so what they're finding in the X-ray image, they found 19 possible X-ray sources in the very middle of this cluster. And why, why should I be excited by X-ray sources? I would imagine space is full of X-ray sources. No, not necessarily. So X-ray sources are the most high energy things, in, mostly in the universe. You've got gamma ray bursts, there's obviously higher, higher energy than X-ray, but X-ray means black holes, neutron stars, pulsars, all of the cool stuff. What they did was they went away to try and figure out what these 19 possible sources were. And they did that by saying, if I take an X-ray image in a very like narrow wave band in X-rays, and I'm gonna do that in a load of narrow bands next to each other, I'm gonna get sort of like a spectrum of how bright it is in those various different bands. And then we know sort of what various different objects look like in those various different bands and what shape they should have when you plot it. Another thing that I think is really exciting is an X-ray binary. And they found two in this cluster. From those 19 sources, they found two, what they think are X-ray binaries. So they found this one, which was they've labeled CX2, and this one, CX6. And so the shape of this sort of density distribution that they found, this energy distribution, matches what you'd expect for an X-ray binary. Binary is two objects, and they happen to be giving out X-rays. So why? So one of these objects is a normal star, the other one is a black hole or a neutron star. So we're talking black holes of sort of stellar mass, like 10 times the mass of the sun. We're not talking supermassive things that are found in galaxies. We're talking like, you know, the piddly things. Piddly. <laughs> in relative terms. So you got a black hole or a neutron star and then some other generic star over here. And what's happening is that this neutron star or black hole is getting quite greedy and it's accreting material from the normal star. And so as that material falls away from that star, it loses gravitational energy. It gains in kinetic energy as it spins faster and faster around the object that it's being accreted by. And as it gains kinetic energy, it gets really hot. It gets so hot that it gives off like thermal X-rays. Now there's two types of X-ray binaries, or well, there's two classes, high mass X-ray binaries and low mass X-ray binaries. They're very inventive with their names. High mass X-ray binaries is when you do just have a generic like main sequence star. So, you know, these stars that's just happily burning hydrogen into helium. It's probably bigger than the sun. A low mass X-ray binary is where you have something that's much lower mass. So you have something that's lower mass than the sun. So it's like a, an M or a K star, or maybe even like a white dwarf. And so you can imagine in a very, very dense environment, um, you form a lot of binary companions. And so that's how the high mass X-ray binaries form. The low mass X-ray binaries though, they think that they're formed through a capture. So you have a neutron star or a black hole that's formed from a normal star. It's probably gone supernova and it's collapsed. 
and then some other poor star, quite low mass, has uh, sort of swung by it and been captured by it. You know, the gravitational field has messed up wherever that star was going originally and, it, and it's now trapped in this orbit and having its material sucked off by the neutron star and the black hole. So these things are really rare because you only get that kind of capture happening in a super high dense environment like M80, which we know is one of the densest globular clusters. There's only about 200 known in the Milky Way that have been found and two of them are in M80. These two that we talked about before? Yeah, that CX2 and CX6 are both low mass X-ray binaries. So it's pretty cool that they're that rare and yet you've got two of them in this Messier object. How does life end for a low mass X-ray binary? Does, does the star eventually just get eaten away to nothing or does the star itself end up thrown into the black hole? Now, well, you've asked the million dollar question, Brady. Well done. Are you going <laughs> to give me a million dollars? I, I, no, I don't have a million dollars. So that's what people have been thinking about a lot lately, is whether these X-ray binaries are going to be a really important object in future studies. Because if you think about the fact that you have a black hole and, and some other object, or a neutron star and some other object, especially the high mass ones, where you have these massive stars that could collapse themselves into neutron stars or into black holes, you then could have two black holes orbiting each other. And you can imagine the scenario where the gravitational feel from having two black holes going around each other would get messed up and they'd end up spiraling inwards until they might merge and that might sound familiar because this is what LIGO has been hunting for when it's been trying to detect gravitational waves so all these news reports we've been having in the past couple of months where it said we've detected gravitational waves from something in space and the model suggests that it's two black holes merging people are excited because they're thinking well could this be because you've had an extra binary that has sort of decayed and then they've merged and you've ended up with gravitational waves being detected by LIGO so I have a handy little little chart um, that I quite like, which unfortunately is now out of date. They announced another detection of gravitational waves of two black holes. So there should be another two black holes merging on here. What you have on here is the mass of the black holes in stellar mass. So this is sort of 30 times the mass of the sun, 20 times the mass of the sun. And you have all of the LIGO detections over here. Now this dash one is sort of, we think this might be a detection, but we're not sure yet. Over here, you've got something that's a 20 solar mass black hole merging with a 30 solar mass black hole. and. LIGO detected the gravitational waves from it. But down here, you've got the masses of the black holes from X-ray binary studies, where you've got two black holes together in an X-ray binary. And you can see that they're much lower masses than what LIGO has been detecting. So the big question now is, are these two separate populations entirely? Are these things that we're detecting with LIGO a part of like formed from a completely different formation mechanism than what's forming the stuff in the X-ray binaries? Or is it that just we're not detecting them? which would be weird because you'd think if you'd have more massive black holes around each other, then they'd give off much more energy and so they'd be brighter in the X-rays, so you'd be more likely to detect them. So that's gonna be the big question in the future is, and you know, what are, what are these two black holes formed from? Are they formed in a globular cluster when you have binary systems or are they just formed as black holes? I, nobody knows yet. The same, no matter which angle that you look at it from, but, these ones look quite different. This one is roughly... A hot dog. <laughs> yeah, we, we call it a, a prolate galaxy. It's meant to be kind of rugby ball shaped. 